Hi, everyone. Uh, the topic of this session is auditing cryptography. And we've got an amazing panel here to discuss what it means to audit cryptography, including best practices. We'd also like to talk about uh, what we see as the future of cryptography audits and the context of cryptocurrencies, blockchains, and other distributed technology, especially in terms of privacy. So as for who we are, I'm Liz Steininger, CEO of Least Authority and a supporter of privacy enhancing technologies being accessible to as many people as possible. I'm here as the moderate, moderator of this panel. And with us, we've also got four panelists, and that is JP Amason, Thomas Pornin, Taylor Hornby, and Isis Agora Lovecraft. So before we start the discussion, let's have you four introduce yourselves. Should we start? Go for it. <laughs> okay, yeah. hi everyone. I'm super happy to be in this panel with uh, all these people. So I'm JP, I've been doing crypto for 15 years approximately, and I've been doing crypto audits for maybe nine or 10 years. A lot of blockchain uh, audits lately, and uh, full disclosure also for, for Zcash. So you're very happy to share my experience uh, about this. Okay, so I'm Thomas Porna. I've been doing cryptography for uh, 25 years. <laughs> And audits specifically for about four years, I work at uh, NTC Group, and uh, that's what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> and before that, I did a lot of things, including implementations. And I'm somewhat known for TLS library called Bare SSL, and I'm doing a lot on, on that for auditing. Uh, hi, I'm Taylor. I'm a relative uh, newcomer compared to the other panelists, but I, I pretty much got started in uh, crypto auditing by finding a bunch of um, horrible problems in random PHP projects and wrote a blog about that. And then I sort of um, graduated on to doing consulting work, auditing file systems. And now I'm working for the um, electric coin company helping to secure Zcash. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Isis. I've been doing crypto for um, about 10 years. Um, in the past, I've worked for the Tor project. I've worked on projects with EFF and Signal. I've worked with the Zcash Foundation and a bunch of others. Um, I have been doing crypto auditing for about less than other people here, probably about five years. Um, and I'm super stoked to join this panel. And Thanks so much for those introductions. Okay, so uh, I'll just mention to the audience, please feel free to send your questions to the chat and we'll take some in the last 10 minutes of the session. So let's get into the topic. Uh, I'm going to start with a fundamental question here. What is the importance of auditing cryptography and why does it matter in the context of cryptocurrencies, blockchains and distributed tech? Okay, uh, I'll start. <laughs> It's important to do an audit because uh, we have nothing better. And uh, it's not sufficient, but we know that cryptography is subtle because uh, like everything in security, but maybe even more so because it's a lot of math, uh, you cannot test for security. Uh, you can try, there are works on proving, but ultimately the only known way to make something secure is to try to break it and see if it resists. And that's what we do and you have no choice. Otherwise, you can get all your money plundered, for instance. Yeah, and a really important aspect of it too is that um, if you're building something, you kind of get into this mindset where as you're building the thing and designing the thing, you convince yourself that it's secure and it's hard, really hard to look at it yourself and try to find problems in your own work. That's why it's like really, really essential um, to hire someone external to come in and like learn the system for the first time and see it with fresh eyes to find those problems. Um, and it's it's really important for cryptocurrency in particular because um, money is on the line. So, yeah. I would add that even though we have some machine methods, we have testing, we have formal verification, that is never going to assure you that the code is matching the math. You need a human there to look at it, to say that this is correct and it's doing the correct thing. Yeah. I think some, something is extremely important for all your audience to know. Um, I, I've been repeating it for the last 10 years, but people don't get it. 
So if you organize security audit, it's not a compliance audit like a SOC 2 or ISA audit. Doesn't mean that your application is secure after the audit. It's better to call it um, maybe security assessment, security review, and it's just part of the security uh, SDLC software development lifecycle. And like uh, my friends mentioned, it's a, maybe a complement to order testing method. It's complement to first testing, to unit testing. Uh, but an audit, security audit will never find all the possible bugs. Um, you don't pass an audit. You do an audit and you do another one and another one and another one, and you keep finding bugs. Okay, these are all great perspectives on why audits are important. I'm sure some of our audience has heard some of that before, but it doesn't hurt repeating like you were saying. We've been saying this for years and it still needs to be said more. So that's really good to kind of um, give context to our conversation too. So um, I guess let's, let, let's get into a little bit about the various approaches to auditing cryptography, especially cryptography. So yeah, what do you, what do you all think about different approaches? And um, yeah, how that can help uh, add value um, beyond just the, the importance that we mentioned. So I'm really curious to hear what the other panelists have to say about this because they have a lot more experience than me. But I kind of see there's, there's kind of two different kinds of auditing. One is like a, a checklist type process where you become really familiar with all the kinds of bugs that have happened in the past. And you're kind of just looking at the design, reading the code and problems that you've seen before and are really familiar kind of stand out to you. And then there's this whole other kind of process, which is way more creative, where it's more like a research challenge where you're presented with a system and you're trying to find a really novel attack. Like if it's a unique system, like a zero knowledge proving system, for example, where there just isn't a huge database of, of problems that are really common, like nonce reuse and uh, weak random number generation and all those kinds of things. Um, uh, so I'm curious how the, how the other panelists like balance those two processes in their own audits, the checklist versus the the creative um, yeah. kind of processes. I think what's important is, um, you know, when we hire people in my company, one of the questions we ask is, what, what is a bug? How do you define a bug? And people say, is, oh, something that doesn't work correctly. But how do you define this? Ultimately, uh, you have, you need a kind of ground truth of what you want to achieve when you when you write some code. And when you audit it, you will, first of all, kind of compare the implementation against these ground truth, which might be a specs, which might be a research paper. Uh, and then you might in turn find shortcomings or incomplete uh, definitions in the ground truth that you have in the specification. Specification might be incomplete, it might be wrong. It might be missing some new things. So yeah, from my perspective, just to summarize is when you approach an edit, the first thing is, like in a pen test, is you define the scope, uh, what you're looking at, what is the, the limitation, uh, do you also did the, so the dependencies, what you want to achieve, um, and what are you trying to protect and what an attacker can do. You need this understanding to be able to define what will be uh, what you, you want to find as an auditor. Yes. Um... A lot of the initial effort is to uh, work out the correct terminology because the, the customer is always have, talking about his stuff with some words and so on, which have a precise meaning. And that precise meaning is not necessarily the one that the customer believes. And uh, they have definitions with uh, limitations and we have to strictly understand exactly where they stop. So, um, one part of my experience here is not about cryptography. It's about uh, arguing a news net about uh, nitpicking about the C standard and X509 and uh, finding out how words can be tortured into saying something else. And many bugs hide there uh, because uh, people just assume that the intuitive notion of what the word means uh, was the true one. Uh, one of my... Uh, pet peeves is that uh, people using, for instance, the word signature to mean something which is not like RSA signature, but uh, hash functions or hash mark or things like that. And a lot of confusion can come from that thing. I remember the, when I audited part of the Zcash um, uh, something update last year, where there was a big change in terminology and I was super confused. <laughs> Like the keys had different names. So. Part of it is not only understanding what the client needs, but I think a lot of it is also talking 
with their developers to understand what's been audited before. Like, I think it was JP, when you were looking at Dalek at one point, you were like, okay, which parts, which parts did everybody else look at? So I don't need to look at those or like, I'll just kind of scan them. But you wanted to know which parts I thought were where the bugs would be. And that's like important to remember that like the client or the customer's developers are not your enemy. They're not, you know, this isn't like some sort of like war game where you're like out to hunt the bug and they're out to hide them. Like everybody wants the bugs to be found. And so it's important to, yeah. So it's important to remember that like you have to work with them because they know the code best. Yeah. There's a lot of psychology work here. Uh, when you look at the source code, you must uh, think about how you would have written the same code. So when it deviates, you know that, okay, they are doing things differently and possibly bad, <laughs> badly. And uh, to have an idea of where they could goof up in some way, what kind of uh, mistakes or uh, oversights could happen. I mean, uh, everybody has different areas of oversight, and I try to have some knowledge about mine, but I also try to have knowledge about that of other people. And that's also why it helps to have external auditors. They don't make mistakes in the same place, so they can see other people's mistakes. Yeah. And, uh, totally second what uh, Isis was saying about welcoming the developers, what's super important is really to have a continuous communication channel uh with the developers that's not what i find the most efficient so instead of you know getting the code and spending one week and then sending your report is every time you have a concern a question something you're not sure about and maybe when you have a potential finding share it with the developers maybe they will tell you oh you missed something it's not a bug or maybe they will tell you oh that's a race that we accept so it saves a lot, a lot of time uh, yeah to go back to what tomas was saying uh with um, looking at code and th thinking like, oh, I don't know, like, what were they doing here? Like, why, why would you do it this way? This, this looks funny, I, it's not the way I would do it. The best thing I think to do there is to go back to the developer who wrote the code and be like, hey, why did you do it this way? And they're like, oh, well, we don't need it to be constant time there because, you know, and they'll give you some reason for like, oh, it, we don't need that in our system, like, it's fine. And then that, that can actually save you a lot of time. So uh, what are some approaches that have, um, or maybe if you want to do a case, like do a case study or pretend uh, maybe an audit that uh, you think um, might be good to talk about as a case study or different approaches in particular that you found worked on different types of projects? Um, I can talk about my, my general process a little bit, um, just to give like a really high level overview of what I, what I do when I'm faced with an audit. Um, I always start with like a brainstorming uh, phase just to try to get all of the like bugs I've seen in the past in my working memory, uh, think about what the system is, use it, uh, try to play with all of its features and think about what could possibly go wrong. And I literally just write out pages and pages and pages of ideas of what could possibly go wrong. And that gets everything into working memory. The idea being that once you start actually reading the code, looking at the design, uh, things will start to pop out to you and, and you're not going to miss because uh, you've already just you've just seen a list of everything that could that could possibly go wrong with this kind of system. Um, and then from there, it's about like hypothesizing um, actual bugs in the thing, noticing I sort of I sort of go through and, and if I if I see it, I think I see a mistake, I don't dig into it. I just kind of write it down and come back to it later. I end up with this big list of like ideas for what might possibly go wrong and kind of prioritize from there. Um, go dig into the most likely ones or the most um, extreme ones, the ones that have the biggest consequences if they're actual bugs and sort of pare it down and write up a report after that. But I'm, I'm really curious uh, what the more experienced people um, do specifically in their, their audit workflows. Usually I'm trying to work uh, bottom up. I mean, I'm, um, I start with the primitives uh, because then when I, look at functions which invoke this primitive, I have some explicit knowledge of what the primitives expect and what they return, and which is usually not very well documented, exact random value, what they do if the value is a bit out of range. And so I'm gradually working my way up. Now, uh, in my work, we are several people and we usually uh, put at least two consultants on each customer because we have different approaches and I have colleagues who will start typically top down. So we meet uh, halfway. 
at some point. But it's a lot for my part of reading source code uh, with my eyes. Uh, and there are, uh, I'm doing uh, old style things. Uh, I don't try to compile. I don't run an ID to uh, get some extra analysis automatic. I don't do fudging. All things, these things are possible. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues do that and do that well, but they just don't match my way of thinking. Uh, uh, I think I, I follow the same uh, well bottom-up approach, at least to some extent, as Thomas, because you know, as an editor, you have one 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 not a fear, but you know, if you are doing audit and you don't find any bug, you tend to be frustrated. So you first look for you know, low-hanging fruits. Uh, so you first see if they use good randomness, if they use good key sizes, if they don't reuse the IV. And it might get you maybe a small kick of dopamine by finding such a, such a bug, and then you're happy and you can carry on with the, the most complex stuff. And so maybe just a reminder for the people who just joined us, uh, security audit is not a guarantee of security, and do not say that you passed an audit, please. <laughs> Actually, this brings up a good question about, um, so yeah, security can't be guaranteed. And, you know, we talked about, um, this is a bit of, this it was mentioned, this is risk management, you know, trying to improve the security, but we can't, we can't guarantee it. So when, how do you, how do you know when you're done? So when you're thinking about your workflow process and you're going through it, like, yeah, I mean, we have a scope of the audit in the beginning, but then you're in the midst of the process and you know you're you're finding stuff you're not finding stuff yeah how do you all figure out when you're when you're done i i don't think you can you can ever be done there's always um in every single audit i've done i've started out with some idea of what the scope would be and i've had to pare down the scope in the final report and say like hey we didn't actually get to look at this dependency we didn't actually get to look at how this library is being used um, so I don't think, I don't think an audit is never finished. Like, like what JP was saying, you, you can't guarantee security. There's always more work to be done, more things to be checked. I think what matters most is that you're honest about that in the report and just make clear what you did check and, and what is still left for, for future work. Well, usually, um, I'd say I'm done when I reach a point where I'm beginning to think, uh, okay. We should delete all that. I will show them how it should be written. And that's the point where I should stop. So I stop. <laughs> so I think that Taylor made a great point. Um, so because you typically do a report, um, which can also be discussed if you need a report, but, and you write what you have found, uh, what bugs or condition improvements. But I think it's also valuable for the, for the client to know what you tried and what didn't yield any bug. Like say, you yeah, I use the static analyzers. I, I tried to find this class of attack uh, and I didn't find anything. And also what, what didn't work. And you also want to say what you did not do, what maybe if you have a time box on it and maybe you didn't have time to do everything you wanted. Uh, instead of recommendations, say, okay, I recommend that you do this and that, or you can say, I'm not confident at all about this. Um, just as, as Taylor said, yeah, be honest and transparent with your, your clients. I think it's especially helpful in the reports I've received and the ones I've created also to mark which dependencies you didn't look at. Because especially if you're doing a, a bottom-up approach, it's really important to look at like very tiny details of what's being called when. And often, especially in large projects that have tons of dependencies, that's just not feasible. And so maybe you look at the ones that are like more suspicious, like you're like, the, these ones are more likely to mess up. But you can't look at all of them, and so it's better to just be transparent and say, like, "Hey, I, I looked at your, you know, constant time, you know, primitive library. I looked at your, you know, signature implementation that you're using. I didn't look at anything else." Yeah, like it can be a big problem in some languages that I will not name. But if you have like hundreds of liabilities, uh, so as I just was saying, you would maybe ask the client, "Okay." Would you like us to look at these three because they they do some deserialization, they do some crypto, and we think it's important. But you you can you can look at all the code that is being used. And... So do you all find that auditing cryptography uh, brings about particular challenges compared to auditing other types of projects like a mobile app or something? 
oh yeah a <laughs> tiny typo can mean a world of difference doing like you know two two bars instead of one bar doing like logical or instead of exclusive or horrible your code is now suddenly not constant time and that's like just one character and you know you're just reading it crisply you're like oh this or this but like the type of or you use suddenly matters drastically and it, when you're in a world of like a single typo matters it's much harder to read the code I think too, a lot of like regular application security vulnerabilities can be mitigated through um, like choice of language, like using Rust instead of C uh, and things like SQL injection can be mitigated by just using prepared statements. So a lot of the more application security type stuff in, you'd want to just recommend to use those things that make the code obviously not vulnerable to a whole class of attacks. Um, but crypto is is a bit different. Um, there's just, there's, there's so many different kinds of things and there's no, um, uh, well, there kind of is there, like, if you use cryptography libraries that have really good APIs that are hard to misuse, um, then you can be pretty confident that any application using those really good APIs is going to be fine. Um, but if it's like an implementation of some novel crypto protocol, then th there really is no, um, there's no checklist it's it's like a creative task to find the the one character that's missing or the things that are swapped around um uh yeah it's it's a lot harder i, I would say I think maybe we can draw an analogy with application testing because you know there's like the the junior inexperienced auditor will who will just follow a kind of checklist approach they will look at the OWASP checklist and do one by one and the more experienced people will try to creatively find bugs, new bugs, try to understand what's going on and potentially find new, new types of, of weaknesses. And I think in crypto is the same, maybe we have much less documentation than application testing, but you can follow the basic uh, checklist approach. And then you need this creativity to really try to understand what can go wrong, especially with technologies which are not really mature, uh, and like zero knowledge proofs and multi-party computation. Um, you need to be able to think, to reason about what's going on, uh, you know, behind the code itself. And you need this skill set that you don't have in application testing. And the other way, I would not be capable of doing good mobile testing, just completely different skills. I'd say that uh, cryptography is new uh, and they keep inventing newer cryptography. So it is not uh, industrialized, automatized. You can automate a lot of check, for instance, uh, SQ, SQL injections. SQL injection. Uh, we know how to automate scanning of source code to find uh, places where that may happen. And that's because uh, it's been around for sufficiently many years that we know how to do that. And for cryptography, uh, we don't yet. I mean, we know part of it. We know how to grab for MD5, for instance. We know that whenever MD5 is somewhere, there is room for goofing up. So we know how to check that, but uh, that crypto from 30 years ago. And we, since uh, there's a lot of new crypto, especially in cryptocurrency stuff and so on, and, and Zcash, and that, it's all new. It's all from like last year or the year before. So uh, it's always new territory to explore. And uh, to do that, we also have to understand the public research. And that's uh, papers written by people who do that uh, all day. And we've done that all day for several years. So it's not easy to understand from scratch. So it's, uh, there are not many people who can actually do that exploration because uh, it requires some academic background. Yeah, so talking about the bigger perspective of time, where do we go from here? So this is new, um, it's difficult. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to say that it's ever done. <laughs> so yeah, where does where do we go from here, both um, from the auditing perspective and contributing to the bigger community? Yeah, I had a question just, you know, Thomas used the, the word MD5, which is uh, this uh, relatively weak hash function that you should not use. However, imagine the following scenario. That's my uh, question to my fellow code editors. You see someone using MD5, and, but not in a way that can be exploited, in a way where you just worry about primitive resistance. 
because I've been in this situation and a colleague of mine would tell me, JP, I found a big bug, high severity, they use MD5. Like, all right, hold on, what can you do? Nothing with MD5. I said, well, my recommendation would be to, to tell them, no, it doesn't look good. You probably want to use something else. Uh, but in itself, it's not a huge bug. But it might make sense to say, oh, put it high severity because this way you will really discourage uh, your client from using MD5. So uh, I don't know. Okay, I had the situation just last week. Uh, I mean, I wrote the paragraph uh, yesterday. <laughs> and I wrote specifically, okay, there's MD5 everywhere in there. Uh, I've checked them all. They all rely on second pre image. For second pre image, there is no practical break uh, yet. Um, it might be that way for the years to come. So uh, you are not on fire. Uh, it would help to have a transition plan to uh, migrate to a non-MD5 world in an ordered way, because if there's an emergency, uh, it won't be ordered, it will be chaotic, and you don't want that. So the advice is, okay, you are aware of it. I must write it down because otherwise some other auditors may point out, ah, Thomas did not see the MD5, what did he do? So I have to write it down just to cover myself. And I recommend people then to, uh, to have a plan and to not, uh, to not handle that reactively just to be a bit proactive about uh, changing that. But the important part is to first begin with, you're not on fire, don't drop everything. That's not the number one priority. The way that I usually explain this to clients is that, because it's like language that developers understand is that it's a code smell. Like, you know, this isn't a problem, it's not a bug but it, it would lead me to believe that something else in the area of this code might also be wrong. Like if you're using MD5 somewhere, what, what other strange choices might you be making that could be bugs? Yeah, it gives you an idea that they don't really know what they're doing. So like if they use MD5 here, maybe they're using RC4 somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. In my case, the source code files started with a, a date which was 1993. Yeah. So when it's all code, I mean, at that time, it was nice. Yeah. More generally, this kind of heuristic, like for example, one of the first things I do when I look at a code base is run an inter, you know, like cargo VP, just to get an idea of the, the hygiene, uh, general, you know, level of quality of the code. And if you have tons of warnings onto the compilation, you're like, mm, maybe they haven't done, the queue hasn't done, hasn't been doing a very good job. Uh, and give you an idea of uh, general quality and attention to detail. That's an important point. I uh, save a lot of time by uh, assuming that uh, a lot of mistakes would have been caught by their own test. Uh, for instance, if somebody writes some elliptic curve implementation, uh, I don't really have to check their, they use the correct formulas because if they, uh, if they got the formulas wrong, it will never work. That's it. I mean, I must concentrate on the edge cases, the ones that they won't see with a single test vector. But a, a lot of things in crypto, uh, when you get it wrong, uh, it's extremely visible that it's wrong. So these are not the interesting bugs and I can uh, save a lot of time in these cases. I also similarly compile the code first and usually run the developer's own tests. We'll first look to see if they have tests. Code without tests usually makes me pretty scared. Um, but yeah, seeing how their code compiles, which warnings they ignored, looking for, you know, if they silenced any any build warnings, uh, looking like it's just like at C, if they have like uh, all warnings or errors turned on, um, yeah, looking at, at how the developers are testing their code. And also, you know, if you're seeing something where it's like a test is disabled, like it's not ever run on their build system, that is also something that would lead me to believe that I need to look at something. Or if they have test vectors where I'm like, those don't look right. Where did you get these? Like, where, where did these come from? They're like, oh, we generated them with Python. And you're like, you, you can't have your own code testing your own code. You got to get it from somewhere. It's got to match the other code. Um, these are things that I often look for. 
Yeah, so I think I, maybe this leads into a good question of um, if, if somebody's going, if, if there's people in our audience who are going to become clients and are going to be preparing for an audit of their cryptography, what could they do or what would you like them to do in preparation before they come to you for an audit? Document the code. And work out which parts are uh, not necessary. I mean, uh, we prefer not having customer to say, okay, the code is start at that GitHub project and uh, you just follow dependencies. There are 37 of them, <laughs> which ones? <laughs> so we like it when customers uh, have a reasonably well-contained scope of things to look at and because they know how their code works. So they are uh, much better at us at finding out where things is to be interesting. Yeah, one of the best days in my life is when I audited a, com a complex crypto protocol. And when I look at the code, I see that there's a reference to a paper and to the line that for each, each line of code doing some, something crypto in the protocol, they said, oh, in algorithm number five, this is line number eight. And they use the same notations as the paper. Um, I didn't believe it. it was ideal, ideal scenario. But the option here is if you implement something, please give the, give the reference uh, of what you implement. And if possible, try to stick to similar notations. It makes our job much easier. Yeah, documentation and writing out the math right next to the line of code that is supposed to implement it is super helpful because then you can have the paper open and the code open. And you can be like, well, they're using the same notation. They're doing the same thing. I can see this matches. Cool. I don't need to go digging for which paper they implemented for some multi-party protocol. I don't need to go digging for, you know, what they meant by a Peterson thing in 1991. You know, I can just like go and, and look at it and say that it's correct. I can uh, give credit to the Zcash developers because uh, I think recently uh, I participated to an, to an audit of um, of Frost and uh, I think to Chelsea uh, Deirdre and Isis work on it. And the code was really well documented with your explanation of which part was doing what. That was a very, very good example. Yeah, I find in, in my own audits, a big chunk of the time just goes to, especially if it's a huge code base, the time just goes into finding where things are implemented before you can even start checking them, right? So having something that links up your protocol spec with your actual code so you can easily go from one to the other and have them open side by side and you're not spending hours looking through the code, um, that really helps. And more abstractly, uh, to be a good client, if you're uh, just on the side of finding bugs, like you're, you don't want the audit um, just to have a, a check mark that you pass an audit. If you really want the auditors to find bugs and you communicate that to them, um, uh, that helps because it lets us know that, that you're on our side and, and you want us to succeed. So what do you all think about sharing results of audits, um, publishing reports and uh, sharing findings and how, yeah, what do you think about that? Uh, free if you can. <laughs> I mean, uh, public reports are a known source of tension. Uh, it's detrimental to good work and uh, good talking. So uh, it's preferable when there is not such pressure because there is a very strong incentive for the customer to have a good audit result. Some things that say that they are good. We really, really do not want to turn audits into flattery. We want to be uh, the more uh, let's say, uh, precise, scientific, uh, only facts. Uh, it's very um, uh, often to me to have this feeling that we're kind of being pushed in a way to make things look more positive. But uh, I think just a way to make things look positive is to have a retest phase uh, during which, uh, after which you, you review the patches that your client uh, has uh, applied after your, your test. And then the report will say, oh, they had a maybe critical or high severity bug, but now it's fixed and I confirm it. So. I mean, it's actually a good thing if you had a critical. Uh, customers who want public report also want uh, that the report said everything is fine. And uh, it should not say that. It's suspicious if it says that. A good report say, okay, we found there was a, a big bug, but we found it. 
which means that we looked at it and it was normal and it was fixed. Yeah. This would be a good outcome and it's very hard to convey this idea to public relation teams on the customer yeah. side. But to be fair, from my experience, I think an overwhelming majority of clients uh, was really, you know, genuinely interested in having you know, just a good audit, us wanted us to find a bug, and very, very rarely we felt some pressure to, you know, make the report look good. Uh, I mean, as long as the report was correct, uh, neutral, objective, sometimes we discuss severities, that's normal, uh, but most of the time, Everybody wants just a fair assessment. And uh, the problem is, what I've seen is not the client itself, but when you do a project for a blockchain project, there's all the community uh, who will react to it. And the community of other blockchain pro projects we might take excerpts out of the context. And this can be a potential, a potential risk. That's, that's great. That tied into one of our audience questions, um, which we can start switching to. One of the audience questions was um, about do auditors feel pressure to have certain kind of results? Um, and related to that, a question too of do auditors feel um, pressure to find something? And um, so, yeah, do you all feel pressure to have find certain things? And um, what can clients do to reduce that pressure? I don't know if it's so much pressure, but disappointment when you don't find something. But it's also relieving because then you get to write a good report. You get to be like, hey, you know, I looked at all these complicated parts of your system, but it actually looks okay. I found, you know, a couple minor issues, but I'm, you know, not worried about anything. That I think is a lot better situation. Um, it does feel disappointing though. It does feel like, and there is like sort of a feeling of like, maybe if I look harder, I will find something. But at some point, you know, you can't, you can't keep looking at everything forever. Yeah, I think totally the same. The only case when it's disappointing or more frustrating from the auditor perspective is when you feel you really did not have time to really understand the code and you really don't feel confident or maybe you don't feel that you've been doing a good job. And then the best thing is to communicate it, uh, to say maybe I need more time or maybe you need to hire someone else. But just finding nothing, if you feel, comfortable with it, then it's not a problem in itself. Good. I think that's really helpful for everybody to know um, the, the perspective um, from the auditing team versus the, the client and the expectations. So um, another question that we've got is, is there any difference in educational background needed for creating, implementing cryptography versus auditing cryptography? What do you all think and what's been your experience? Well, it's not exactly an educational uh, difference. It's more a question of experience, which is an other name for uh, old age. And um, it helps a lot to have an implementation background to do auditing because whatever the developers are doing, you worked in their shoes before. So you, you somehow have an intuitive notion of where they would have failed because you made the same mistakes some years ago. Uh, it helps. But it's the same, uh, ultimately the same set of skills. It's about uh, fully understanding uh, what you're doing at the mat level and how it will be translated in the various layers down to the transistors on the CPU. And so it's basically the same. So except that, of course, well, one would say that the developer is thinking functionally because he wants the code to work and the auditor wants to break the code. But in fact, the developer should also try to break his own code. If to produce something which is secure, the developer must always be hostile against himself. <laughs> and it's uh, relatively hard to do. And uh, auditors just do that all day. And that's usually the difference, in my view. I would say that the skills go hand in hand. Um, they're very much the same thing. And in doing one, you can learn about a lot about doing the other. Okay, another question from the audience. Um, does having more than one implementation usually help auditors in any way? Uh, it does in some cases where, um, like, let's say you have two implementations of a, a symmetric crypto primitive, like a cipher hash function, like something like that. 
then you can do like ran automatic, automatic, like randomized testing to compare the two implementations. And that kind of, the, if you have other things in the audit that you need to focus on, um, like there's a whole other protocol to audit and you really don't want to have to dive into this hash function implementation. It really helps to just be able to write that test and, um, and be, and be able to do that. Um, yeah. And typically when you do this, what, what Taylor mentioned, you, first of all, you can do this kind of differential testing or differential fuzzing. Uh, but oftentimes you will also find bugs in the other implementation that you're not being paid to review. But ethically, if you find bugs, you will report them, you will find an issue. So as a byproduct, they get a free audit of the, the code. The worst case is when you find a bug in a dependency, and then you're like, oh no, who else is using this dependency? And you go and you look on GitHub and there's like 37 other blockchains that all have the same dependency. And you're like, oh God, now I got to report all of this. Like, and I'm not being paid to do it. I'm only being paid by one of them. That's the happened and it's not. Worst case is when you find a bug in a standard. <laughs> Especially one which is used everywhere. <laughs> That's a bad thing. Yeah, actually, I think this brings up a really fascinating point that, um, yeah, Isis, you mentioned we don't get paid <laughs> for that part is if, if we find a bug that's being used by others and we have to report it elsewhere. So, um, yeah, how do we handle that? Both uh, not just from the auditor's perspective, but also from the perspective of a broader community. Is there something that we can do to, to maybe to help that? Because that's a, that can be a big problem. Well, uh, for me, it's easy because NCC has a team dedicated to disclosure. So I just hand the potato to them and it's their job. <laughs> so that's the easy part for me. Uh, now, in practice, of course, you don't want to uh, make the world burn, except sometimes it, the world needs burning. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, don't go blabbing about it on Twitter right now. I mean, uh, just <laughs> wait five minutes. Oh it's worth thinking about the consequences. Thomas, can you give me the address of your disclosure management team? Because <laughs> um, uh, I also think I need their help. I would like to hire them. Yeah, because <laughs> oftentimes I've found a bug. I'm like, I don't want to go through the process of finding where to report it, explain it, follow the, the format and having endless discussion with the developers. So sometimes I would just, if it's not something critical, I'm like, okay, someone will, will find it. Or I would just post an issue on, on the project, but yeah, it can be a, not a waste of time, but a big time investment to do this properly. All right, well, we've only got a couple minutes left. So I wanna give you all an opportunity to say any kind of like last thoughts, final points, uh, anything you want. Yeah, well, I'll go first. Well, first, thank you for having me and for organizing this, this panel. I think it was a good discussion. We could carry on for four hours. Um, no specific last point, but yeah, then again, so no, it is not no guarantee of security, as we said before. Um, yeah, nothing specific. Yeah, I would yeah, also maybe. like to echo. It was a really great panel and thank you for having us. Um, and also again, JP's point of like, please don't ask us for a check, check mark on your code. We don't want our name next to a big check mark that says it's okay. Yeah, thanks to all the panelists for coming. This was really fun. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, listening and, and watching. Okay, well. And Thomas, thank you everybody. Fun? Thanks to the world. World peace is great uh, and so on. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, okay, I, yeah, I do think there's some, some things that came up during this panel that were really good points. And so I thank you all for sharing your experiences and your thoughts about auditing cryptography. And hopefully the audience feels a little bit more prepared to maybe become a client or to read an audit report or to just know about cryptography and the tools that they use. So again, thanks, Pan. Pan <laughs> Thanks panelists <laughs> for uh, joining us and thanks Zcon too for uh, Zcon and the Zcash Foundation for organizing the conference. And thanks audience for coming. See y'all later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.